Let's turn our attention to the design of members experiencing direct stress. Remember direct normal stress is just uh, represented by the symbol sigma, which is simply force over area. Now, in order to have a member that is experiencing direct normal stress, some conditions have to be met. So if the member number one is straight, if it has a uniform cross-section over whatever section we're interested in the stress, if the material is homogeneous, it can't be made of uh, material that, that varies throughout the length of the member, if the load is applied along the centroid, and if it's a compression member, if it's short, then the member uh, will have uniform stress over its entire cross-section. So think with me of just a, a member in a bridge, okay, just a truss element. And that member, if it's, if it's curved, this won't work because if you're pulling on either end, the force has to lie along the same line, but the, mem the material doesn't lie along that force line. And so you end up having bending stresses and all kinds of things, and you can't have direct normal stress in that member. Uh, so the, the member has to be straight. Obviously the material has to be homogeneous or it'll stretch in some areas or you know maybe the mem center of the member is very soft or has a very low uh, elastic modulus but the outer is much stiffer. Well then they're going to carry different amounts of stress. So the material has to be homogeneous. Now the load has to be applied along the centroid because think of just a a column, a simple column. If you apply a load to the center of that column on one end of it then the stress can distribute equally or, or evenly, but if you apply it offside, say at the outer edge of the, the circular column section, well then there's going to be some bending inherent in that beam and, or that member, and so um, we wouldn't have direct normal stress in that case. Also, the reason for requiring that if it's a compression member it, it be short is that actually compression members can buckle. They can go out of planing. You can kind of see that with this ruler, hopefully. As I press on it, I'm going to have to cheat a little bit because I can't press hard enough. But as I press on it, I can actually make it go out of plane. And if I could apply enough force, it would just buckle naturally without me uh, having to push it on the side. But the idea is that if it's a compression member, it must not be experiencing buckling in order for it to have simply a direct normal stress. And when we say the cross section, we're saying, you know, here's the member. If you imagine cutting it and looking at that area where you've just cut, that's the the cross-sectional area that we're uh, talking about. Okay, so let's talk about design stress. What is that? Well, you never load a material all the way up to failure. You never, you know, take a, a tensile specimen, see how much force it takes to pull it apart, and then say, okay, that's the amount of stress I'm going to apply to whatever machine I design this material out of. That's a really bad idea because you, you're designing it right on the brink of failure, right? And now, you might wonder, well, to what level do we design things? Well, there was a, a friend of mine who also was a teaching assistant for a course when I was at main campus. It was a machine elements or a machine design course, and uh, he had worked in the aircraft industry. And he said that they only allowed a 15% margin uh, against failure. So if they knew the, typically I don't think he was talking about the ultimate strength of the material. He was probably referring to the yield strength of the material. They would stress a material. Uh, to a level that, um, how can I explain this, it was very close to failure but not quite, okay? It's quite concerning. You'll understand more where that 115% comes into play here in just a minute because there's something called the design uh, factor and really the design factor is the ratio of the material strength to the design stress. So if I rearrange the equations that I've got here N is the design factor, and it's equal to the strength of the material divided by the actual strength or the actual load or stress, I should say, that I'm going to apply to the material. So uh, the design stress is some value of stress that's lower than the material strength uh, where we've deemed that the design will be so-called safe. Now, there's a couple of different things to compare to, right? Think about it. Materials have yield strength and they've got ultimate strength, and those are two different levels of stress. So which one do we design against? Well, it all depends. If it's important that the material never yield, then you have to design against yielding. So the strength you compare to is the yield strength. But if it's just important that the, the material never fracture, then we could design against the ultimate strength of the material. And so you see a couple of different equations here with the design factor in in the denominator 
where we're calculating the design stress on the left hand side, the sigma sub d, based on either the yield strength or the ultimate strength of the particular material. Now the design factor is also known as a factor of safety. So you could think about it this way, if you wanted to go buy a car and you thought the price was going to be $10,000 but you brought along an extra um, you know, $1,500, you would have a factor of safety of 1.15. And that's the factor of safety that's used apparently to design airplanes. Uh, maybe you can think about that next time you're riding an aircraft. Uh, but actually, riding aircraft is safer than riding a car, so of course the crashes are a little worse. So a design factor of one is the absolute minimum, right? That's where you're saying, I'm going to load this material to the point where it's on the brink of failure because this is the level of stress where it essentially failed when I performed tests on a, you know, a tensile test. So that's not typically a good design factor and, of course, not typically used. Now, how do we determine the design factor? Well, you have to take several things into account and also there are some standards and codes that are used. Sometimes you don't, it's not up to you to decide what the design factor will be. There are codes and standards that dictate what it will be. But often, whatever product you're working on in designing, uh, it's been something like it has been made before and the experience of the company you work for or people you're working with will guide uh, an, a proper, an appropriate selection for the design factor. You have to decide whether you're gonna design against yield or ultimate strength or some other strength. Um, the manner of loading is really important. If you've got a material that's being bent over and over again, then you have to compare to the fatigue strength. Now, there's not really a good way to do that in our textbook, so you'll see how we do it here in just a minute. We just basically provide a large design factor. Uh, also, the type of material is important. Is the material ductile or is it brittle? That will, in part, determine what design factor we use. Because think about a brittle material. It doesn't have a yield point. So you can't design against yielding, you can only design against the ultimate strength of the material if the material is brittle. Now, what about if the material is going to be misused? What do I mean by misuse? Well, I watched a video a while back, it's been, I guess, about a year now, and these kids, I say kids because I think what they did was fairly immature, they went to Walmart, right, and they bought a, a mongoose trick bike. Now, when I was a kid, a Mongoose was a, a really good brand. Everybody that was into BMX bikes wanted the Mongoose because it was the, it was the best. You could do anything with it, and it was pretty much indestructible. So these guys buy this Mongoose, and it's, they probably posted this video a year or two ago, something like that. They, they, they were pretty good trick riders, so they took it out to the course, uh, I guess it was some type of skate, uh, skate park or something, and they rode it around, and of course ended up absolutely decimating, destroying this bike. I mean, yeah, the bike had pegs, but it was pretty obvious. It wasn't really designed to be a trick bike. So they ended up misusing this thing and obviously abusing it. And then took it back. The poor thing was, it still had, I think they left the tags on it, but they put it in a, a cart to carry it back because you couldn't even roll it anymore. The wheels had all tacoed, and I think even the frame was bent. And they, they took it back and got their money back because of Walmart's generous return policy. So, of course, you know, it's kind of a, a jerk move to do that, but they were, I guess, in a sense, it was probably worth it to Walmart to, to, um, uh, although Walmart wasn't in on this, it was probably worth it to Walmart to advertise their generous return policy, so they probably didn't care. Um, anyway, just an interesting thing. So you always have to think, is there some way that this will be misused? If so, how likely is that misuse? And do I really want to design to protect against misuse? A lot of times the answer to that is yes, because um, a lot of times users will um, misuse a component in a way that the designer never even thought of. I know when I was in high school, my brother-in-law, he wasn't my brother-in-law at the time, he was dating my sister, and it seemed like he would crack up and, and uh, wreck his BMW about every other week. That's what it seemed like. I know it wasn't really that, that frequent, but, and he didn't buy expensive BMWs. He wasn't rich. He would just buy used BMWs, and the reason he bought it is because his, he happened to buy a BMW first, and he ended up going around the corner late at night. I don't know what happened. He, was, he didn't drink, so he wasn't drunk or anything like that. But he went around a corner, and he ended up snapping a, a telephone pole in half. And so it, it turns out that the telephone pole came in on his driver's side door, and yet he walked away from this wreck. Part of that was because he was young, but another part of it is because at the time, BMW was one of the few you know, handful of manufacturers that put a reinforcing steel bar in the door. 
and that bar had prevented the pole from coming in farther and really hitting him and damaging his body. So he was immediately sold and has driven uh, beamers ever since. But it seemed like he'd get in a wreck ever so often and we'd have to put in a new stereo system. So me being the geeky kind of guy, I always, he'd buy the stereo and we'd build a, a base box because at that time woofers were, you know, the thing to have in your trunk and we'd, we'd set up an amplifier and wire it and everything, get it going. And it was so interesting because I was the guy, I was the functional guy, and he was the aesthetics guy. He always wanted it to look good, and I always just wanted to make sure it worked. So we'd install it, and he would, uh, he'd always somehow break it in a way that I didn't expect. And I'd have to figure out how to make it work, you know, despite. So I'm not saying he misused it. It's just that the, the way he applied load to this thing would uh, be different than the way I expected it. And uh, we seemed like we we're always installing stereos in his cars. Now also you may want a larger design factor if the stress analysis of the part is very complicated. So if you have extremely complicated geometry a lot of times what you'll do is you will number one start off with a simplified model where you can calculate the stress theoretically in the part but then you a lot of times will move to finite element analysis and sort of, you know, once you get your results from finite element analysis, they're good as long as they're relatively close to what you've calculated by hand. That helps you verify that the FEA analysis is valid. But even then, a lot of times, the FEA analysis doesn't necessarily give you the maximum stress at very small points. And so, since the stress analysis, analysis can be very complicated, a lot of times what you'll do is compensate for it by adding a little bit to the design factor. Then the environment that the component will be used in is very important. If you have a part that's going to have salt water spray, salt water spray is a very difficult uh, um, uh, element, environmental factor to desi design against. So you might just add extra material so that some of it can be disintegrated by the salt water and yet have enough material remaining to support the loads that the part will see. So other things that might affect the design factor are things like the size. As you go up in size, the the effective ultimate strength and yield strength go down. And the reason for that is because as you go up inside, it's more and more likely that the material will include some kind of foreign matter, something that's not supposed to be in the materials, something that uh, makes the material cool differently when it's being heat treated. And so it's harder to control the cross-sectional properties and be sure there's no uh, weakening uh, elements in the, the the material, and so essentially you uh, you account for that by increasing the size the, or the design factor. See, the problem is when we take material and we pull it apart, we pull apart little pieces of material. Because if you have a, a piece of steel this big around and you want to pull it apart, you have to have a heck of a machine to do that. So it's practically impossible to test very large components because you simply don't have the machinery to do it. So you're testing smaller samples of material that are easier to pull apart. And when you use more of that material, you, you, you know, the, the, a dog bone that's got a cross section of a, you know, a tenth of an inch doesn't scale up perfectly to a component that has a cross sectional area of, you know, 20 square inches or something. So the size effect is, is something that is, is important as well. And there's a couple different reasons why you might bump up the design factor because you know that the material, the average material that you're going to make your large component from is going to be weaker than your test material. Another thing is quality control. If you know that quality control for a component you design is not going to be very good, you might simply bump up the design factor and you might say well that doesn't make sense I mean shouldn't we always want to do a good job yes we should always want to do a good job but what is a good job is it a good job to design something so that you price the the thing out of the market no that doesn't make sense now quality control can actually be a cost savings uh, endeavor but trying to let's say you're making something that's really inexpensive and uh, the material is cheap in that case, there may not be a whole lot of benefit in trying to, you know, determine the material properties all that accurately. You might say, well, here's the apparent strength, but I know tomorrow we're going to get in more material, and that material may have half the strength of the batch we got today. Sometimes it's not worth it to try and dial in the strength and get that material more consistent. Sometimes it's better simply to throw more material at it, okay, essentially by increasing the design factor. Another thing that determines the design factor is 
how bad is it if failure occurs? If if people die when the uh, components fail, you need a bigger design factor, right? You need more margin for error. Now, the example I gave earlier of my friend who worked in the aircraft industry, their design factor was 1.15. Now, or at least apparently, that's what he claimed, I, I believe him. Now, why on earth would you use such a low design factor when if the plane goes down, people probably will die or have a high chance of dying? Well, the reason is because otherwise the, the aircraft doesn't get off the ground, right? So uh, the aircraft has to be able to fly to have any use at all. I mean, when was the last time you booked a flight on an airplane that taxied to where you were going, right? That's called a bus, right? It doesn't need wings. Uh, and then the design factor can be, you know, much higher if necessary because the bus doesn't have to fly. I was reminded how much airplanes are like buses. Last time I flew, we were taking off down the runway, and you could feel every bump and hear the the components, the interior creaking and everything. And it didn't make me afraid because I knew the structure was sound. But it's it's the same thing that happens in automobiles where, you know, when you're going down the road, if your door panels are rattling, you hear all these squeaks and things, it sounds like a low-quality uh, car. Well, in the same way, this airplane sounded like it was going to fall apart going down the runway, but, of course, I knew it was just... Uh, components inside of it uh, vibrating and being somewhat loose and so I wasn't really worried about it uh, but it just reminded me that how appropriate the name Airbus is for a company that makes aircrafts because they are much like buses so anyway uh, cost is another uh, reason that you might have to uh, increase or decrease the design factor and then the market segment in which the part is used is another big uh, determiner of the design factor because if the market segment it typically uses a particular design factor going far away from that can be particularly expensive whether you know if you significantly increase the design factor now your your uh, component potentially costs a lot more and you're going to be priced out of the market or if you decrease it significantly then you're known for poor quality things that break so what are some guidelines for these what design factors should we use well if you have direct normal stress there is a table it's 3-2 that gives us some guidance for just simple direct normal stress, just tensile stress. Okay, this could be compressive stress, but usually we think of this as a tensile stress. By the way, all of the charts like this that I'm going to show you, or all the tables like this I'm going to show you, are summarized on one page in the back of your book. You really need to right now get your book, put a tab on page 721, and label it design factors okay because that's where you can go instead of having to dig through all the chapters which is this this information actually spans multiple chapters you can simply go to the back of the the book and find all of them in one convenient place so as we go what i would suggest you do is note the tables i'm showing you and see where they are on page 721 so if we have uh, this table is broken down into two parts. If we have ductile material, the design factor will be different than if we have brittle material. And notice that for ductile materials, at least in static loading, we're comparing to the yield strength. Now you might look at this table and say, well, I see one SY and a bunch of SUs. So SY is the yield strength, SU is the ultimate strength of the material. Did they somehow mess up and just misprint it's supposed to be SU? No, it's not a misprint. Let's discuss for a moment why we're using all SUs over in the brittle material. Well, that should be obvious to you at this point. I've mentioned several times that brittle materials don't yield, right? They just fracture at the end. So the reason we're using ultimate strength for brittle materials is because that's all we've got, okay? Now, if the loading is static, that's the first row in our table. If, if it's just a static load that's applied to the part and just sits there, then we should compare it to the yield strength. And the reason is because the, we don't want the part to deform. If it deforms, it may be useless. So we should compare to the yield strength. So we're just going to take, you know, what's recommended is just to use half of the material's yield strength as your design stress. So you see that the design factor in is equal to 2. How about if we have a repeated load? What do we mean by a repeated load? Well, if I take a piece of material and I apply a load to it. I'm going to have to apply bending because you won't see any motion if I try to stretch it. If I apply a load to it over and over and over, it turns out that that type of loading is actually called fatigue. And fatigue is a type of loading that causes material to fail at much lower stress levels than you would expect from just a simple tensile test. As a matter of fact, that kind of stress that's loading, unloading, loading, unloading, actually causes failure at stresses much lower than even the yield strength. Now it turns out that 
that so-called fatigue strength or endurance strength is more closely correlated to the ultimate strength of the material than to the yield strength. It, it just simply matches better, okay? And so that's why under repeated loading, even for ductile materials, we make our design stress a function of the ultimate strength of the material and give it a generous design factor, eight in this case. What about impact or shock loading? Well, impact and shock loading have, can, can end up causing loading that is much larger than is expected. And so again, since these would be a repeated type load, we're comparing to ultimate strength, but we're also bumping up the factor of safety or the design factor to 12 in this case. Now you'll notice over in brittle materials that the design factors are even higher here. Why is that? Well, it's because brittle materials tend to, f obviously they fail due, you know, at, at their ultimate strength, but if you have a repeated load, then we need a little bit mar larger margin of error. Okay, if you have impact or shock loading, we need larger er uh, 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 factor safety. And the reason for all this is because it's possible that the load will just barely go above, just occasionally, every now and then, go above the ultimate strength. But at that level of stress, it's guaranteed the brittle material is going to fail. Uh, brittle material fails catastrophically. It doesn't it's not pliable, it's, it's not ductile, right? And that's the reason that we bump up the factors of safety or what we're calling the design factors um, to get a, a lower design stress from you know, this material. All right, so I basically stole my thunder from this slide. Um, I don't think there's anything here to discuss that I haven't already, so I'll give you a moment to read through this while I consider it. Yeah, I, I said all of this. There's nothing that I missed here. So, All right, now, what about shear stress? Remember, shear stress and normal stress are two different types of stress. And materials have different strengths in uh, tensile stress versus shear stress. So if I take th this material and I, I pull on it this way until it fails, I have applied sigma to it, right? I've applied normal stress to it. But if I take this material and I try to shear it, right? I can't do it, I'm not strong enough, plus I don't want to break my ruler. But if I were to take an hour to shear it, so that I've now, it's like cutting it in half with a pair of scissors, this, the amount of force per area required to shear it this way will be less than the force per area required to pull it apart that way with normal stress. So our design uh, shear stress equation is very similar to what we've seen for normal stress. It's just, it's compared to the shear property. So for example, if we're basing our uh, design stress on the yield strength in shear, then it's SY sub S indicating the yield strength in shear because materials yield, yield in shear at a different level of stress, a level of, uh, well, numerically of, of uh, shear stress, then they yield in the uh, elongation direction or in, the, in uh, tensile stress. Now, there's a good approximation that where you can calculate the yield strength and shear from the yield strength and tension. Just take the yield strength and tension and divide it by two. Now, this is a theoretical thing. This is not exact. It's not perfect, but it's close enough for most purposes. And you'll see later on when we talk about Moore's circle where this comes from. So what about design guidelines for shear stress? What, how much, um, uh, how much shear should we apply given that we know the strength of the material? Well, again, we typically don't know the yield strength and shear. What we typically know is the simple yield strength due to normal stress. And so since those two are related to each other by a factor of a half, what we'll usually do is use the yield strength itself, okay, the, the normal uh, yield strength rather than the shear yield strength, and so you see that in this equation at the top where it's a, a node essentially at the top of the table and it says that the design shear stress is equal to the yield strength due to normal stress divided by 2n and that 2 comes from the fact that we need to convert it from a yield strength uh, in normal stress to a yield strength in shear stress. Now the design factor n will depend on the particular loading uh, characteristics. So 
If we have a static load, we're going to use a design factor of two. If it's a repeated or a fatigue type load, then we'll use four. If it's an impact load, then we'll use six. And so you see over here on the right all of the uh, equations for the uh, design shear stress based on number one, the fact that we normally use the yield strength in, uh, uh, you know, due to normal stress and the fact that we're using a design factor of either 2, 4, or 6. Now you might look at this and say, well wait a second, last table we had a column for ductile material and a column for brittle material. What's going on? Why, why is this just for ductile materials? What would I do with shear uh, uh, you know, stresses in a brittle material? Well it turns out that brittle materials do not fail due to shear stress. They fail due to normal stress. Now you can take a brittle material, if this, if this ruler was a brittle material and I tried to shear it, I am applying shear stress to it, but that shear stress is related to normal stress and actually the, the material would break not along a straight line but along an angled line and the reason for that is because it's actually a conversion of shear stress into normal stress and it's the normal stress that causes failure in brittle materials. So we don't need this. Uh, for brittle materials because we're not interested in shear stress in uh, brittle materials. We're only interested in normal stresses in brittle materials because that's what's going to cause failure. So if we use brittle materials in shear, shear well then typically we will uh, use design factors higher than for ductile materials. There's not a lot of factors published uh, because really the way you should go about this is by transforming the shear stress into normal stress and designing against that. But there is some, um, some information available if you want to consider the shear stress in a brittle material. And for aluminum alloys you can see there that the ultimate strength in shear of alumina, aluminum alloys that are brittle is about 65% of the ultimate strength in uh, tension. For steel, it's about 82% of the ultimate strength in tension. Okay, so you notice that that, that, uh, that factor of two was for yielding, right? But brittle materials don't yield, so we've got different numbers for relating the ultimate strengths uh, in uh, shear to the ultimate strength in tension. So there's a table of uh, information. One thing that may be particularly confusing is the ultimate strength of cast iron in shear being actually higher than the ultimate strength uh, in tension. Another thing to discuss is stress concentrators. Stress concentrators are areas of geometry where the shape changes relatively abruptly and when that happens typically you get stress concentration. You, get, you can think of it as lines of flow having to flow around an obstacle um, and so stress is actually concentrated in these areas and you can see that in fact in some of the past lectures you've seen uh, photoelastic uh, materials where the it's pretty obvious that stress is concentrated in an area like around a bolt hole or something like that. Uh, so stress concentrations are something that we have to consider because that's a localized area where the stress is simply a lot larger than it would be in the bulk material. So we're we're moving from the simplest case of stresses that are evenly distributed along a cross section to more real parts, parts that aren't just uniform stress at every point. Now there can be higher stresses in some areas. And there's some fairly simple geometries that have already been measured for us where we can measure or where the, the stress concentration factors have already been measured and we can simply use them for a, a family of geometries. And of course they're non-dimensional. There'll be things like if you, you look at this, the stress concentration factor will be a function of the small diameter of the rod over the large diameter of the rod. It will also be a function of the ratio of the radius of that inside shoulder, r, lowercase r, to the smaller diameter d. And if you take those ratios, you now have uh, two different non-dimensional parameters and the behavior of this type of, of feature, which is very common, it's a step and a shaft, the, the behavior of this type of feature can be predicted fairly well and the stress concentration factors can be recorded fairly accurately. So this is just a simple shaft that's being pulled on on either end axially. And so we can look up the stress concentration factor KT and uh, thereby figure out what the maximum stress is. So the way we do this is we look at the geometry, 
parameterize the problem according to the whatever stress concentration tables we have, which by the way they're in appendix A22, I think that's where they start. There's actually several different geometries and several different stress concentration factor tables or figures and you'll want to know where they all are, at least where it begins and where it ends, you should put a tab. But basically the maximum stress in the part near the stress concentration factor is the stress concentration factor which you get from the chart times the nominal stress whatever would be the stress without that stress concentration factor now you'll see how to use these more in the context of example problems but you need to be aware that around disruptive features there are higher stresses and that's where failure is most likely to uh, begin